Welcome all. We begin with this week's parsha, a series that are going to take us until the very end of the book, that are going to uh, introduce us to the details of, of the Mishka, uh, the tabernacle as it was built in the desert, uh, that would then see uh, you know, various incarnations uh, you know, in Shiloh, in the Holy Land, and then in Jerusalem as a, as a uh, built structure rather than this portable structure, would become the focal point of, of, of worship and, and, and of, of, of sanctity, uh, which would emanate uh, from uh, this uh, Mishkan. So here's a representation of it. Um, but the question I pose tonight is, what's it all about? And why do we need this? Um, and, uh, you know, it's kind of modest uh, in, in size, it's not a huge structure. Uh, yet, you know, we're going to be dealing with the, the details of it. This week, Teruma Titsa, the Kitisa, by Yakel Pikude, taking us, you know, five weeks uh, ahead. What is it? So, to understand what this is, what its importance and centrality is, we need to go to the beginning. When I say beginning, very beginning. So here is a, a famous verse uh, from Song of Songs uh, that talks about, you know, we know Song of Songs is, 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 is a dialogue between Hashem um, and uh, the, the bride, uh, being the Jewish people. And Hashem says, Bati I have come to my God, my, my bride, my, my bride, Choti is my sister, uh, and then, you know, you know, some very nice imagery, which we're going to talk about today. Pluck my myrrh and spice, eat my honey and honeycomb, drunk my wine, my milk. Eat, love, and drink, drink deep of love. When I'm not going there, let's just look at that very first sentence. I have come to my God. And there is a, a rather famous medrash. Uh, it's in uh, Medrash Rabba on that verse. Okay, first verse in the fifth chapter of Shir Hashem, of Song of Songs, and this is what the, the Medrash says to us. I've come into my garden. Uh, what is this about my garden? So Rabbi Menachem, son of Rabbi Lazar ibn Avua, Vuna, sorry, said, quoting Rabbi Shunim Rabbi Yosena, it doesn't say I came to the garden, it says I came to my garden, to my wedding canopy, canopy to the place that was the site of my initial appearance. So Hashem is talking about coming to a garden, coming to my garden, uh, implying that he was he was there previously. Where um, was Hashem's initial appearance? Was not the first appearance, says the Medrash, of the divine presence in the lower realm. Um, and the Medrash answers its own question. It says, of course, it was. Uh, where Hashem first appears in the world uh, is in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. Uh, but even before that, and there is Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, uh, and it says they heard the voice of Hashem moving about in the garden. So this is Hashem's um, um, initial um, kind of place of being, and, and basically the Medrash is saying, or the verse is saying, Hashem says, I've come to my garden, I've come back to what was my original hangout. And so the Medrash proceeds to tell us that that's history, that God was uh, in the garden, that's history. Um, but then something happened. And it seems Hashem must have left the garden, then he came back. And that's Batila Gani, I've come back to my garden. And the Medrash describes a process that took, whew, it was actually thousands of years. Um, where Hashem's Shekhinah, which was in this world, left the world. Um, and what would chase what would chase the Shekhinah away from this world? Uh, if the world gets enveloped by darkness, uh, which is anti-Shekhinah, anti-purity, anti-divinity. Uh, so the more darkness there is in this world, the more obscurement, is that the right word? Um, the more there is darkness covering godliness and so the major says it's like Hashem leaving this world and the major describes a process that took seven stages seven stages uh, during uh, through which uh, the, 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 the presence of Hashem kind of the Shekhinah left this world 
uh, stage number one, very early on. Of course, we know that on the very first day of, of uh, man being in the Garden of Eden, uh, they're being chased away. Adam and Eve uh, commit the first sin, uh, and with sin comes darkness into the world uh, and causes Hashem to remove himself. The Medrash says Hashem removed himself from earth, up into the first heaven. And then didn't take long until we have the very tragic uh, you know, fratricide with uh, Cain killing his brother Hevel. And of course, that brings further darkness into the world and a, a further removal from Hashem from, from first heaven to second heaven. Um, the sin of Enosh is not specified in the Torah. It talks about the generation of Enosh. Uh, among the first ten generations that are listed at the end of the parsha of Bereshit, it says that Enosh uh, was in the world, and Azuchal. Uh, then they began. Uh, it would seem that it was the beginning of, of idol worship. You know, it was difficult uh, to to have idol worship uh, at this stage here because I mean they they'd experienced they'd seen Hashem. Um, and uh, you know they'd spoken to him, they were, they were there. Uh, but as they get further away from creation, people began to they began to worship um, various forces and other powers uh, of forces of nature. And, and with time, um, that developed into full blown idol worship. But Enosh was you know, in his time; uh, it would seem that he was a Part of this, um, there was this was this this uh, um, beginning of, of of a pushing of Hashem uh, further away from second stage to to third stage to third heaven, and then we have the generation of the flood. Of course, we know but totally degenerate uh, people uh, that have sunk into immorality and dishonesty, uh, theft. Um, it says Malah Aretz Hamas. It describes a world filled with Hamas. I'm talking about a terrorist organization that's being hunted down and uh, destroyed at the moment by the soldiers of the IDF. Uh, Hamas means robbery, uh, means theft, and, and the world was full of, of this kind of a very poor behavior. Um, okay, we, 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 we're kind of co covering centuries here, and we're going. You know, with Hashem's Shechina being pushed away from this world further, further up until it gets to the fourth heaven. And then we have the generation of a tower of Babel. When again, there was rebellion against Hashem. Um, we've had Shirim about this. We've discussed what the sin was, but it, was, it wasn't good. Uh, and, and it kind of pushed uh, the Shechina one step further. So from you know, level four to level five. Um, following that was the generation uh, was dumb and the people behaved in, in the immoral way uh, and again uh, in a uh, cruel way of Zdom and, and, and that kind of cruelty again totally against uh, the presence of Hashem pushing away uh, the Shekhinah one further stage and um, we get to Egypt and we're talking you know earlier on the days of Abraham not the Egyptians and what they did to us uh, a few hundred years later uh, Days of Avram, we discover Egyptians being a very immoral nation um, and a, a, a people who, um, you know, Sarah's kidnapping case in point, um, they, they, you know, were not known for their upright um, moral ways. So because of the way the world degenerates, uh, beginning with the original sin, number one on the list, um, which was uh, you know, the, the, the forbidden fruit, going right through to the Egyptians' uh, immorality, the Shekhinah gets pushed away from this world. So it's going into kind of further and further hiding, eventually ending up in, 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 in seventh heaven, uh, if seventh heaven is the, is the highest of, of, of the seven. Then the Medrash says that process had to be reversed because the Shekhinah has to come back to earth. It doesn't belong there. And that's the I came into my God and the of coming back. How did that happen? Well, that happened when the process was reversed and that happened through the work of um, Tzadikim, who worked very hard to bring the uh, Shkina back to be with us. So whereas, you know, the Rashaim, as they are listed here, out of a name or by their generation, um, pushed Hashem away, we then get to 
seven tzaddikim, and, and, and those are great people who work each in their generation, and those are much quicker, so successive generations. Here. Avram followed by his son Yitzhak, followed by his son Yaakov, um, and uh, we're then going to take the line of Levi, um, and Levi had a son called Kahat, who had a son called Amram, and by now you've guessed who number seven is going to be, um, and, and, and number seven, Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, he's the one who finally brings Ishkemer down. Now, of course, that achievement is the most significant of all, uh, because even what Amram did was to bring him down from, you know, from second uh, level heaven to first heaven, but the Shekinah wasn't here yet. And Moshe brings the Shekinah down. Um, and where does this happen? Uh, what would you think is Moshe's greatest achievement uh, in his life? It would seem that this is the revelation at Mount Sinai, where Moshe Rabbeinu is there, and he literally creates a bridge between, between heaven and earth, uh, the Torah describes how Hashem came down on Mount Sinai, um, and, and it's kind of what was this unbreachable, um, you know, chasm between the heavenly and the earthly um, is now being breached, and at, at Mount Sinai we're being given the ability to sanctify the mundane, to sanctify, uh, to bring spirituality, to bring uh, divinity into the physical by doing mitzvahs. Uh, so that's the achievement of Mount Sinai, and that's Moshe's um, major achievement. Um, and so, you know, he's remembered as the seventh, um, and uh, in some versions of the Medrash, it even says, in the seventh of most precious, Shreem Chavivin, and Moshe Rabbeinu brings the Shekhen down to earth. Uh, so whereas we would say that Adam and Eve had the you know, the, the, the terrible uh, responsibility of kind of moving Hashem on the process away from the earth, Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, standing on the the, the, the shoulders of, of previous generations, but he was the one who actually brought the Shkinder down to this world. And, you know, reading the Medrash, one would assume, well, that's Mount Sinai, when, you know, heaven and earth literally met when God spoke and the earth heard the voice of, of Hashem um, when um, there was actually, you know, a, a, a bridge created between the spiritual and, and the physical. However, this is not it. What happens next is far more significant and far more important, even though it wasn't maybe the fireworks of Mount Sinai, you know, the sun and the light show, uh, which is literally, you know, stood there and it says the people, what does it say, heard the, saw the sounds, uh, you know, heard the voices, uh, saw, saw, saw the sounds, in other words, Rolim uh, so uh, kind of an out of this world uh, experience. And how do you know this isn't it? Um, so we know that Mount Sinai was off limits. And the Jews were told, Moshe was told twice, remind the Jewish people they may not go anywhere. And, and, and they kind of, you know, fenced it off, so to speak, and nobody was like going to the mountain by penalty, uh, you know, of, of actually um, you know, death for going up on Mount Sinai. Um, but then what happens next? What happens next is even before um, the Torah is given on Mount Sinai, Hashem says the following. Yes, uh, this is in uh, the parasha two weeks ago, Yitro, 19th chapter of Shemot. You got to sit down for the people, tell them, don't go up on the mountain. If you touch the mountain, you will put to death um, by, by, by stoning or be being shot. I think I'm not sure of the translation. A trespass, trespasser shall not live. But then, significantly, when the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they may go up on the mountain. So the sanctity of Mount Sinai is only temporary, only while the revelation is taking place. And then, once the, the, the shofar is sounded at the end of the entire uh, revelation, Mount Sinai is no longer off limits. The sanctity of Mount Sinai is gone. In other words, although the revelation at Sinai was the greatest, most profound, the most spiritual experience that the world ever went through, it was only a temporary experience. Now, why was that? Why was that? 
because it was an experience that was created from above. Our role there was passive. Yes, we, we went to the mikvah, we cleaned back clothes, we prepared, uh, but you know, for 50 days before that, we were sunk in, 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 in the depths of, uh, sorry, 49 days before that. Uh, uh, we had you know, the 49 gates of impurity. Uh, we were almost at the point of no return. Hashem pulled us out of Mitzrayim, uh, and that's why it always describes uh, the Exodus as, as a flight from Egypt. We had to run away from there because the, the forces of impurity that were threatening to engulf us, and we were nearly sunk to that 50th level where there's, there's no return. Um, so uh, not much time has passed. It's seven weeks, and we may maybe cleansed of the impurity of Egypt that had clung to us. But basically, we're standing there as total passive bystanders taking it in. We did nothing um, at Mount Sinai except stand there and listen and hear. But we didn't actually create anything of our own realities. And this is why um, it was only temporary, because it was, you know, generally, you know, if, if, if you're in teaching, for example, uh, if you stand there and feed information to the kids, then there's this thing that goes in the one ear, uh, and then before the bell is rung at the end of the lesson, it's out the other. If you allow students to go on, and it's not just kids in school, if you allow students to go on a voyage of, of self-discovery, of coming to conclusions by themselves, of, of learning and, and, and achieving in their own, that type of knowledge is much longer lasting because it, it came from within. Uh, so the revelation at Sinai, as powerful as it was, as powerful and as strong as it was, dissipated after the event. Um, but what we got there was uh, a book, a tool book, uh, a manual that says, now, here's how you can do it yourself. And that's the 613 mitzvot. But the very first task the Jewish nation goes about is building that Mishkan. And Mashevket, of course, takes the lead. And what we're going to be reading about in the next five weeks in the Torah are the instructions on how to create sanctity below, how to bring God down, but not by just standing there at Mount Sinai and saying, okay, God, you want to come down? We, we, we're here, we're watching, we're listening. But we're actually creating it you know, on, 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 on a, with our own energy. And, and that is something which is deeper and more lasting. Um, and that is actually Moshe bringing down uh, that. And, and you know, the, the uh, story of the seven generations is actually in two Midrashim uh, that I'm aware of. Um, we're looking earlier at the text of Midrash uh, Rabbah. There is a Midrash called Midrash Tanchuma. And this is how Midrash Tanchuma talks about that last stage. When Moshe rose, he brought out a divine presence to earth, as it is stated, and the Lord came down to Mount Sinai. And so it's written, when I come to my garden, uh, my sister bride, I'm not sure what C-A-N-T means, because we call it the Song of Songs, whatever that is, uh, 5.1, that's definitely the verse we're looking at, Shira Shira, when I come to my garden, my sister bride, when when the tabernacle was set up. So that is actually when it happened. Yes, it began in uh, Exodus 1920, but it only came into being two parishes later in Turuma, or actually in Vayakil Pikude, when Hashem's Shechina actually rested um, in, in that tabernacle. So Tanchuma um, makes that very clear. And Tanchuma uses a very interesting expression, this Medrash. He talks about the fact that God wanted to have a global place on earth. And this is his dwelling place. This little home, this little Mishkan, a uh, very, very modest structure. I mean, yeah, a lot of gold and silver, precious materials. It wasn't cheap to put together. But in terms of, you know, grandeur and, and space, it was it was fairly small. Um, and, and, and yet, this was the focal point of sanctity from then on. Now, how does it work? So the wisest of all men um, we know is uh, King Solomon, and, and even he battled with it, of course, and he's going to express his, I wouldn't say uh, cynicism, um, but wonderment 
at this process. Uh, this was when eventually the temple in Jerusalem was built. And um, after the temporary structure, which was then kind of made semi-permanent, when it stood in Shiloh, which actually stood for, for three and a half centuries, and eventually the ark is brought to Jerusalem by King David, and the Mishkan is rebuilt there. King David is uh, decidedly uncomfortable uh, with the fact that he is what he calls uh, living in, 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 in the palace of, of, of Acacia Wood, of Cedar, um, whereas the, the, the Temple of Hashem is in the tent, uh, and he wishes to build a permanent structure. Hashem says, you're not the right man, because uh, you, you, know, you lived your life as a man of war, conquering territory, uh, and, and consolidating you know, Israel's military strength. Your son, Solomon, Sh Shlomo, um, who is, uh, uh, his name contains the word Shalom, uh, in it, your son will build the, uh, the temple. And this is what happens. King Solomon, after his father's death, ascends the throne, to the throne, and he goes about building a home for Hashem. Eventually, it's ready. Um, and when it's time for the inauguration um, of that temple, um, he, he, he recites a prayer. Uh, so it's a long prayer, but I've only uh, quoted uh, one uh, verse. It's in uh, the last Himal of Kings 1, chapter 8. And this is what he says. But will God really dwell on earth? Even the heavens to the uttermost reaches cannot contain you. Famous verse. How much so, more so, this, this house that I, have, that I have built. Why? You know, he, 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 was, he was wondering about the mechanics of godliness being contained in a physical structure. But what was it really? It was really a focal point of godliness in one place on earth. And to illustrate that, that this was really, um, and, and, and this has become the, the focal point of, of, our, of our prayers, um, and so, you know, wherever we go in the world, uh, we're always facing the Holy of Holies in, in, in the temple, or the spot at least where that Holy of Holies used to be. Uh, in, in Jerusalem, we, we face Israel from wherever we dive. And if you're in Israel, you're going to face Jerusalem. If you're in Jerusalem, you're going to face Temple Mount. And if you are, you know, on Temple Mount, you, 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 you need to be directing your prayers towards uh, the Kodesh and Kodesh, but the, the Holy of Holies. That becomes... Um, a place where God dwells in this world. Um, and in fact, when you entered into the temple, you could you could sense God's presence. Uh, and that was an invitation um, to bring Hashem's presence into the entire world by removing all that obscurity that has been brought in by successive sin. And, and, and the more mitzvahs we do, and, and the less sins we perform, um, the more we make this world divine. Uh, but in that, that room of the Holy of Holies, there was a very interesting phenomenon uh, that defied God earthly laws. So that, you know, you wouldn't really go in there because uh, it was off limits and nobody ever went there. Um, but, but there was an interesting phenomenon that took place there that showed that the, the, the rules of earth do not apply. And this is how the Gemara puts it. If you're in the um, Holy of Holies, then you find that the place of the Ark of the Covenant is not in the measurement of the Holy of Holies. Basically, uh, from wall to wall, if you take a, 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 a you know, tape measurer and you, and, and, and you measure from one wall to the other, you will have a total distance. If you now measure from the one wall to the beginning of the Ark and, and, and from the other wall to the end of the Ark on the other side, uh, you'll find that 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 space uh, on, on on the sides adds up to the entire length or width uh, of, of that room. Um, in other words, you know the normal rules of of, of geometry don't apply. Um, it's like you have an embassy of uh, say the United States of America uh, in Saturn or wherever, where, you know, and and. and and what uh, legislation applies, there, which rules apply on that ground uh, are the rules of the um, of the United States. Um, but the normal rules of, uh, say, South Africa 
you know, don't apply, wouldn't that, that's accepted in terms of, uh, you know, diplomacy and, and embassies around the world. Um, so think of the, the Holy Temple as the embassy of the divine on earth. And therefore, worldly rules do not apply there. Um, because um, it's 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 a divine. Now, of course, the Holy of Holies wasn't the room that was seen by many because it was off limits. It was visited by the Kohen Gadol only on Yom Kippur, um, and and that's it. Uh, hence, hence that wasn't really a place where people could experience Hashem up close and, and in a real way. Um, but the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot tells us. That there were ongoing miracles, and um, that those who came to visit in the temple could could experience. So there's a Mishpirkei uh, Avot in uh, the fifth chapter talks about the ten miracles, ten wonders that that happened. Uh, that no woman ever miscarried, uh, even though uh, it, it couldn't have smelled very nice. That the meat never became rotten. That flies were not uh, ever seen uh, in 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 on the floor where it was really a slaughterhouse. There were so many sacrifices uh, that the Kohen Gadol never became impure on Yom Kippur because that would actually um, invalidate him from the service. That even if it rained heavily in can in Jerusalem, but uh, you know when the fire was. Was uh, going on on the on the altar. It, it, it remained even with heavy uh, fire in the winds. You know the, the column of smoke went up absolutely straight. Um, that the omer that they brought uh, was always uh, with, without uh, defect, as was actually as were the two loaves. Those are the, the two loaves that are brought on Shavuot to the showbread. Lechem uh, Lapanu, which was brought every week, um, that the people stood pressed together, uh, close together, crowded in the courtyard, came to a bowing down, all had space, um, that never did a scorpion or serpent harm anybody in Jerusalem, um, and that nobody ever said, this is, it's, it's, it's too cramped, I've got no place to sleep overnight. Uh, those are kind of open miracles, each of them. Um, and uh, generally, miracles don't happen for nothing. Miracles happen for a reason. What's the reason? Uh, because it had to be demonstrated. I mean, you came into the Holy Temple. You were not subject to the normal laws that apply to the rest of the world. You were not subject to the laws of nature. This was a, a divine place. And really, our task as humans is to fulfill that which the Medrash al says. Uh, that is... To take that 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 rule book and that instruction book, that manual that we were given uh, there in in uh, in uh, at Mount Sinai, which is the beginning of the process, uh, and that tells us exactly how we are able to um, exactly how we are able to um, um, bring heaven down to earth. Are we able to make not just that one place, the, the, the Holy Temple, the Mishkan, but the entire world a dwelling place for Hashem? Really, this is why Hashem created the world and then concealed himself, hid himself, uh, because he didn't want the world to be a holy place because he had imposed himself. Uh, God wished for the world to be a holy place because he had, um, we had uh, brought Hashem and recognized him uh, into this world. So that's the job that Moshe began, uh, and that we have been following his uh, instructions and lead in his Torah. Uh, it's taken, you know, 3,300 plus years. Um, but ultimately, when the entire world uh, is divine, uh, we've reached the end of, of, of that phase in history. Uh, and that's uh, phase two, which is uh, the Messianic age. Um, so hopefully, we are very close. Uh, to that completion. Um, thank you very much, and have a good night. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Well Rabbi. done. Thank you very much.